Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. The students at many school districts across San Antonio returned to campus today for the first time in person instruction. Even as new cases of COVID-19 continue to be added at Northside ISD, the area's biggest district, nearly a quarter of employees who applied to work remotely this school year were denied. It's not like we don't want to serve our kids. I think that all teachers want to serve their kids. We enjoy the interaction with our kids, but at the same time, we need to have some protection for our own medical and our own health. As the night team's Dylan Collier learned, it's already been a semester filled with dread for some educators. It's tonight's Defenders investigation. I can't be the only one going through this. This Harlan High School teacher twice submitted applications to work remotely, only to see Northside Independent School District administrators twice deny her request. First, telling her the anxiety diagnosis she cited did not qualify as a concern for contracting COVID-19. So I said, well, let me submit it under my husband because I know he's got a medical condition. And although his autoimmune disorder surely qualifies. The medication I'm on uh, lowers my immune system. The husband and wife who asked that we conceal their identities received more bad news. They came back and said, oh, we're declining your second request to work from home because it was submitted after the deadline. So the educator made the difficult decision to sit out the next three months and went on medical leave. Her school's principal, Robert Harris, telling her in an email, quote, thank you for informing me of your intent not to serve our students on the first day of school. A district spokesman defending the tone of the email, claiming the sentence was not meant to be offensive, but was intended as acknowledgement of the employee's notice. So within the, the interactions that I've had within the past week, I don't want to go back like I would rather do any other job right now than go back to a negative, horrible environment where I feel like I'm just going to be singled out every day. Records provided to us by Northside show that 1150 employees applied to work remotely this school year and that 278 or 24 percent were told no. The job can be done from the home. Tom Cummins is president of the Bear County Federation of Teachers, which represents the interests of educators working at multiple San Antonio school districts, such as Northeast ISD, but not Northside. He says the union's position has been clear. Returning to in-person learning anywhere in San Antonio was a mistake. For the last six months, students have been at home, not circulating in the community. Now when they're coming out, the incidents are going to rise. The next few weeks will determine if his prediction is correct. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Now the Harlan High School teacher tells us district officials changed their mind and approved one of her applications to work remotely. She opted instead to go on FMLA and will reassess the COVID situation late this year. Asked about the remote work denials, Northside ISD said in part, Quote, in evaluating applications for this waiver, NISD used guidelines established by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for those underlying conditions placing an individual at higher risk. Employees whose applications were denied had the opportunity to appeal the decision. End quote. And two special prosecutors providing a fresh set of eyes on the Marquise Jones case. Jones was shot and killed by an off-duty SAPD officer in 2014. Back then, Nico LaHood was the Bear County District Attorney. Just last year, Joe Gonzalez took office. Today, the first time the Jones family says they've met someone in the DA's office. The night team's Jaffney Gray with the outcome of that meeting. We've received some additional information from the Jones family attorney. Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez says he's assigned two veteran prosecutors to review that information and the entire case. It would be their first time on the Marquise Jones case. We walked out of there, out of the DA's office today with some hope. Hope. That's how Deborah Bush, Jones's aunt, described her first meeting with any district attorney. The meeting comes six years after Jones was shot and killed by an off-duty San Antonio police officer. The DA's office has committed to communicate with this family every 30 days until they reach a decision to reopen. And we see that as being a victory today. Gonzalez says once the case review is complete, they will decide whether the case needs to be reopened. If it amounts to what is called newly uh, discovered evidence, something that should have been presented to a grand jury, then 
uh, we'll, we'll certainly make that decision at the time. In February 2014, off-duty SAPD officer Robert Encina was struggling to arrest the driver of a car Jones was riding in. He says Jones got out of the car and pointed a revolver at him. Encina fired eight times but only hit Jones once in the back. Investigators did recover a revolver from the scene but could not link it to Jones after failing to test it for fingerprints for several years. You shot the wrong person. And if Marquise had have been in the wrong, I wouldn't be standing here. The DA says he supports appointing special prosecutors and officer-involved shootings and killings, but says finding a way to fund it is tricky. If we need a special prosecutor, we have to rely on going to other counties. And of course, they have their own case caseloads to deal with. Uh, so we've got to be a little creative. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Again, just to clarify, the Jones case is not being reopened. Once these prosecutors finish their review, which will take months, they'll provide their recommendation to the district attorney. By the way, coming up, Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez joins us live for our KSAT Q&A. We're going to look into shootings involving law enforcement, race and policing, and how the pandemic is affecting court cases and how domestic violence is rising during COVID-19. It's coming up around 1035. The deputy involved shooting of Damian Daniels had Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf calling for change. Deputies were responding to a mental health call last month. Family members say they notified responders that the combat veteran had a weapon and after a struggle, Daniels was shot and killed. In a commentary released today, Wolf called for various changes like taking mentally ill and drug addicted suspects to a care facility instead of jail. He also told KSAT that commissioner, commissioners would not sign a union contract with the Deputy Sheriff's Association if it did not include a civilian review board. Turning now to the coronavirus pandemic, another change in our risk meter. We have now entered the dark green stage labeled safe, but Mayor Ron Nuremberg reminds you it's not an excuse to let your guard down. Our positivity rate has dropped to 6.7%. We've had a two week decline in cases. To keep on a positive trend, health officials say mask wearing and social distancing are still important. Tonight, we had 193 new COVID-19 cases reported along with one new death. 304 people are in the hospital with 134 in the intensive care unit. 81 people are on ventilators tonight. Preparing for the worst, hoping for the best. Concerns about how the flu season and COVID-19 might interact have medical professionals urging the public to get their flu shots. In 2019 to 2020, the CDC reported there were between 24,000 to 62,000 flu related deaths in the nation. As the 19th Patty Santos reports, past flu seasons were busy enough without a pandemic. We saw a fair number of patients per day in our emergency department with flu-like symptoms. In the next week or two, University Hospital staff expect to begin testing and treating patients for the flu. Symptoms include fever, body aches, cough, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, sometimes diarrhea. Symptoms similar to COVID-19. I suspect we're going to be testing a lot more patients for both. Flu test results are known in about one to three hours. Metro Health says the last flu season was mild with one pediatric flu death in Bear County. We don't track every single case of flu that can occur in Bear County, but we estimate that every season we have about 5 to 20 percent of our population that gets flu um, and pediatric related influenza. Texas reported six pediatric deaths last season. Dr. Anita Curian says that number is often 10 to 15 in a bad season. It is very important that all of us um, get our flu vaccine as soon as possible. Medical staff at University Hospital are changing their approach. This year, the hospital will maintain isolation units for patients with respiratory illnesses, separating those with mild to more severe cases. Always hoping for a mild, but okay with a modest uh, season. Uh, it's when we get pr hit pretty hard, as we've had in past years, uh, that it really uh, takes a toll on everybody. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Medical professionals tell us in the southern hemisphere where the flu season is in full swing, cases have been mild. They think it may be a ripple effect of the social distancing, the hand washing, the face covering brought on by the coronavirus. 
And look who we captured on our city cam earlier today. This is a nice sight. Good downpour moved through parts of San Antonio, including the downtown area and basically right up the 281 corridor and even 1604 on the west side of town. It really added up to just over half an inch at the airport and several rain gauges confirm that as well around other parts of town between a quarter and a half an inch with rainfall estimates between those gauges nearly an inch, especially along the I 10 corridor northwest of downtown. And we had some spotty showers throughout the day today, some good accumulations farther east of town, especially Lavaca County. And right now we have some isolated showers farther south, Catula, Freer toward Three Rivers. This is all pushing uh, Fowlerton rather all pushing northward and I think we'll see further development through the night and even tomorrow morning some scattered showers, but I think the bulk of them will be closer to the Rio Grande west of I 35. However, rain becomes more likely as we go throughout the day tomorrow all across South Texas. Look at this potent cold front. It's 40s, lower 40s in the panhandle. We have a lot to talk about. I'll see you in a few minutes. Looking to lengthen the lifespan of your technology, tomorrow on GMSA, we're going to share three tips that cost little to no money. It's still ahead of the night. Be changes in a police force after days of protests. The mayor of Rochester, New York, making a promise after the death of a man pinned to the ground by police. And the Senate presenting a new stimulus bill, what it has and what some say is missing. That's coming up. And the Salvation Army takes a hit after some of its responders were involved in a rollover accident. The volunteers had minor injuries, but there are concerns for the major damage done to the group's truck. How we can help coming up next on the Night Beat. They were responding to the need for help after Hurricane Laura hit when this Salvation Army truck rolled over. The volunteers are OK. That's good news. But the Salvation Army is now looking for ways to replace the mobile feeding unit. It helped people not only during disaster situations far away, but it was also used to feed people in our own community. The night team's Tiffany Huertas has a look at the impact it will have on the organization's mission. And, you know, we were on the way to do our part to try to help you know, as many people as we could. And so it's, you know, unfortunate we weren't able to fulfill this particular mission. Salvation Army volunteers were heading to Louisiana to help people impacted by Hurricane Laura when it was involved in a crash. Miraculously, our uh, volunteers were OK. But the truck was a total loss. The mobile feeding unit was equipped with a stove and a refrigeration unit. The truck costs around $300,000. There's a hurricane, tornado, flood, you name it. Uh, these trucks are designed to be deployed for even weeks at a time, potentially serve three meals a day. The organization has used this truck many times since they got it in 2007. We've actually used it more this year for um, food distribution purposes, serving meals. All right, obviously there was a problem with that story. The Salvation Army is raising funds for a new San Antonio mobile feeding unit. You saw the very the various ways it's used in our community. For more information on how you can help and how you can contribute to the Salvation Army and help them get a new mobile unit, you can visit our website at ksat.com. Of course, we apologize for the malfunction with that story. For Americans struggling during the pandemic, another stimulus bill is on the table. But will lawmakers be able to come to a compromise? Today, the Senate unveiling a newly constructed scaled down measure. It does not include money for a second round of direct stimulus checks to Americans, but it does include proposals for an extra $300 in weekly unemployment benefits. This would likely be in addition to the $300 payments authorized by President Trump. But those payments are only expected to last for a little more than a month as it's paid out of federal disaster relief funds. Senators expecting to bring the aid to the aid package to a vote on Thursday. We're going to get the stonewalling of Democratic leaders out from behind closed doors and put this to a vote out here on the floor. It's only a check the box so that some of his endangered Republican senators can go home and say, well, see, I tried, but it isn't trying. 
The bill is not expected to get the 60 votes it needs to send it to the House, where it's already facing opposition. They've been serving up lunch, dinner, dessert for decades to those who visited this cafeteria. Now Luby's looking to liquidate and dissolve the company. San Antonio was where it got its start, and now the expected end of the Luann platter and other signature dishes striking a chord with several visitors. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I love Luby's. I've been here in San I was born in San Antonio. I'm 81 years old, and I've always been to Luby's. While Luby's is homegrown, it was later sold to a company based in Houston. That's where they moved their headquarters. Unless a buyer steps forward, its board of directors say the plan will move forward. It's unclear how soon the cafeterias will close. The same company also selling the Fuddruckers restaurants that they also own. So many good memories at Luby's. I remember go yes, my biggest Luby's kid. memory is going there when I worked on Thanksgiving. Yes. Like they were open. <laughs> yeah. You could get that turkey meal, yeah. bring it into work or good eat time. there. That's that's my biggest loop. Good memories. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is actually going there with you when I uh, first moved to San Antonio. <laughs> yeah. Dream me to Luby's. That's See, right. They, they right. don't have it in Minnesota. Yeah, or Washington, D.C., yeah. where I was. No, 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 no. It's just around here. Anyway, okay, so we have a lot of weather to talk about. We've got better rain chances tomorrow, cold front headed our way, and that will likely lead to a big temperature spread and a huge swing across our area as we get into Thursday. So let's take a look at the radar right now. We have some areas of rain, light to moderate in nature, moving into southern Atascosa County, just clipped Tilden area, and not far from Los Angeles between I-35 and I-37 pushing northward. This isn't a lot of rain to speak of, but I do anticipate more to develop as the night goes on. Even we just have new development here in Real County outside of Lakey. A few little pop up heavy showers just developed. Again, more activity likely to develop through the night and especially through the day tomorrow, but it's not going to be an all day rain event tomorrow. This is part of the big picture here. Look at the big upper level dip in the flow. That's very important. Draws cooler air southward and this cutoff upper level low. It's got a cold core with it, a lot of energy, and it's been dumping snow. Hard to believe Denver was triple digits just a few days ago. Then they got the whiplash of this cold front yesterday. 90s today, 30s and accumulating snow. I just saw a picture my cousin posted who lives in Denver. The snowman the size of his toddler. So legit snow and they're not even up at elevation. We also have the cold front that's already draped across West Texas. That's pushing our way and that's going to gradually slowly make its way into the I-35 corridor. I think by Thursday. So let's start with our future cast and talk about rain. Then we'll get to temperatures. Waking up tomorrow morning around sunrise we will have some widely separated showers, a little embedded downpour here and there. But I think most of the activity, at least the heaviest and most persistent rain, will be closer to the Rio Grande for the first part of the day. Then we get into the afternoon and this model starting to pop up these showers and storms elsewhere with most likely the heaviest rain and the highest accumulations, I should say, west of I-35. Our best chance here in San Antonio and along the I-35 corridors, the second half of the day, but the highest accumulations overall, likely closer to the Rio Grande, and that's where we need the rain most, according to the most recent drought monitor. This could, this could kick the drought in the teeth a little bit. It really could. This would be a drought denting, maybe even drought busting rainfall for some communities. I know it has us in this category of maybe half inch to an inch. I don't agree with that. I think we could see one to two inches easily by just a few of these downpours hitting your neighborhood. It all depends on where the heavy is set up. All right, temperatures. Some 80s still here in South Texas, 70s as well. Oh, 40 degrees in Amarillo, Lubbock 49. There's that cold air plunging southward with this cold front that's going to continue its trek southward, dragging that cool air along with it. Now, here's the big question mark with this front that is still up in the air tomorrow. We're looking like we'll be in the 80s, 40s in the panhandle. But by Thursday, the big question mark is where exactly is this front going to get lazy and basically camp out for a little while? It's going to get lazy, slow down, and at some point near the I-35 corridor, likely stall. That would mean the big temperature spread on Thursday. We could see some 50s in the upper, in the northern hill country and 80s along the coastline. Okay, all because of that boundary, depending on exactly where it decides to stall. It'll be a matter of miles in terms of your temperature at your house. But I think by and large, we'll be in the 70s on Thursday. Tomorrow, 80s, but 
Rain chance is up in the 70th percentile. That's looking good, especially the second half of the day. Yes, cooler, 78 on Thursday, but we're not talking like pumpkin spice kind of weather here. Mm, Just bummer. a noticeable drop and some more areas of rain. And then we spike rain chances again a little bit on Sunday That's in the good. upper 80s. All right, thanks so much, Adam. You do realize, though, just that drops enough for some people to go for the pumpkin spice. That'll be me. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so you realize that, Adam. All right, so these are two players that will have an impact wherever they decide and end. No up. question. You can imagine them together on the same team, which is yeah. what they wanted to do with Judson, but that request has been denied. In fact, their appeal denied today. Who denied it and how did it go down? We will show you. We'll have a reaction from one of those two athletes. Plus, when we come back, it's the big game and our big game coverage this Friday night in Marion. Coming up. Two of the city's best football players have been denied a chance to play for the Justin Rockets. Quarterback Jordan Battles led the Brandeis Broncos to the state quarterfinals the last two seasons. And running back L.J. Butler, who's rolled up 2,000 yards a season in the last two years while taking Wagner to the state quarterfinals as well. Battles had transferred to Judson last February, Butler this past June. But today, the University Interscholastic League Executive Committee denied their appeal after listening to principals, parents, athletic directors, and head coaches who had concerns over their move. The whole family was going to uproot and go live somewhere in Cibolo. Um, mm. Once the family didn't uproot and the daughter stayed, then that was the initial point of concern for me. With one student being here at Wagner High School and one student being at Judson, even though at times a house can be divided, I just thought that the circumstances were, were kind of strange. Now, Battles has since registered at Holy Cross High School where his father once played, and that's where we caught up with the Battles family today. You know this place is home. You know I was I was down bad at the time, and when I, I when I turned to somebody, this place was already there. So I got I'll forever love these guys. This is a tough day for us, you know, but but we're mentally strong, we're mentally prepared. You know I came here, you know my son's been playing Pop Warner here. You know this is where he started. The kids got a history here. He played Pop Warner with probably half of the kids on the team. Um, it's just it's neat to have him have a chance to get to be with them. Sometimes it just doesn't work out, and I just told him. Uh, Come back and we'll talk a little bit later. Let the let the emotions take, you know, let them go through their emotions. And I told them I'll be here for you to talk to whatever happens and do the best I can to make sure that they get they get what they need to get. Now there are discussions about Butler possibly returning to Wagner. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The Houston Texans will kick off the NFL season the day after tomorrow when they travel to Kansas City to face the defending Super Bowl champions in their first game of the pro football season. The Texans are nine point underdogs in their playoff rematch. They ended their season last year and after the offseason was altered dramatically by the COVID-19 pandemic, how's it finally to get on the field to play? For the game to actually be here and only be a couple days away, uh, it's very exciting. And, you know, you start building up that adrenaline, that excitement. You've fallen into your game week routine. Um, there's a sense of normalcy that necessarily hasn't been there, you know, the whole time. Um, and we're really excited about that. And I think the guys can feel it and you can start to feel it. Guys locking in, getting focused, everything kind of falling into that game week routine. And uh, we're excited. We're excited to give the fans a show. We're excited to put that product on the field and we're excited to compete. Dallas Cowboys have signed Randy Gregory to a one-year contract extension after he was reinstated by the NFL. They will have him making up to $2 million. He can't practice with the team until October the 5th. And it appears the Broncos have lost star defensive player Von Miller for the entire season after he tore a tendon in his ankle in the last play of practice today, according to ESPN. The big game and our big game coverage Friday night next. UTSA head coach Jeff Trailer is coaching for his debut this Saturday when the Roadrunners football team kicks off their 10th season this Saturday against Texas State in San Marcos. On Monday, Trailer had told us his team had been hit pretty hard with results from not only the COVID positive test, but also the antibody test, which are now required by Conference USA in order for the players to be cleared to play. Today, Coach Trailer revealed just how many had been affected. The issue that's got everybody a little confused right now is when they made the rule about the antibodies. So anybody that has any antibodies in your system, you have to now also go get EKG. You know, you got to get with a cardiologist. You got to get heart issues cleaned up as well before you can be cleared to play. So, you know, we had 13 kids that were unable to practice today, but we're hoping nine of them will be able to play Saturday. So you can imagine what that's like as far as organizing a practice. It's just crazy. Kickoff on Saturday is at 2.30. The game will be on national TV on ESPN2. 
The big game and our big game coverage features a battle of the early unbeatens. Number five, Marion in the sub 5 8 12s top 12, facing off against number six, Comfort in Marion this Friday night. Both the Bulldogs and the Bobcats have opened their season 2 0, with Marion defeating Carn City 14 13 in their adjusted season opener just three days after the Badgers had to cancel their game against Kennedy due to positive coronavirus tests. And then last week, another squeaker 24 23 over Goliath. For the Bobcats, they've been much more dominating in the first two wins with a 42 0 shutout over Brackett and 30 6 whipping of Mason. Now the pair collide this Friday. Just watching film. I know they have no no quitting them, so we got to get ready for that. You know, I believe our boys they're gonna push themselves this week. Yeah, we're just feeling good right now with the two and zero right now. We've been working hard at practice, so I mean, all that momentum is really gonna help us Friday night. I know we've had a couple close games, but what our kids have shown is a lot of you know facing adversity and knowing how to finish, and our kids have done a great job doing that. All right, kick out between the Bulldogs and the Bobcats in Marion on Friday is set for 7.30 p.m. And Case Hatto Sports will be there. Can't it'll, wait. It'll be a great game. First time we've ever been live out of Marion for a Friday night game. This will be awesome. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Craig. You got it. Up next, our live Case at Q&A with Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez. It's coming up next. It's a chance for us to go a little more in depth on some of the uh, issues that we are facing as a nation and certainly as a community. And we are pleased to be joined by Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez tonight. Uh, Mr. District Attorney, thank you for joining us again. I, I don't know that we can say this enough, but I want to clarify the fact that you are not reopening the Marquise Jones case. You're just having a couple of your prosecutors who have not looked at this case before take another look, that's, correct? That's correct. Um, and thank you for saying that. It is important that we clarify what we're doing uh, to the public. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, as soon as I came into the office, uh, I re-examined these cases uh, coming to the uh, coming into the office. Uh, but we recently have received some additional information, uh, and just like I've committed uh, in the public, when we get new information, we will look at it. I think anybody who is in this position that is seeking justice wants to get at the truth. So we're going to review that, and as you mentioned, I've assigned two veteran prosecutors uh, to look at everything from the very beginning and give me their independent assessment, and then we'll decide uh, where we go from there. But again, as you mentioned, this does not mean that I'm reopening anything. It just means we're taking another look at it. We're considering whatever additional information that's been provided us, and we'll see where we are at that point. You know, at the top of the show, we reported that you met with a family, as you just mentioned there. Talk about your decision to meet with them. They, I, I could sense that they were frustrated that they had not got, received the answers that they had been looking for. Just talk to us about the decision to meet with not only the family of Marquise Jones, but also um, Damien Daniels last week. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, what we realized in being uh, in, in office for, for almost two years now is that we've been doing a lot of uh, positive things in in our office, but have not been as 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 good at communicating what we're doing. So a lot of people don't don't understand what uh, what we do, and that's especially true when it comes to officer involved shootings. Uh, it's important to to make clear to the community that we're a separate agency. We don't work for the police. They don't work for us. We review the cases that they bring to us, and that's what. That's what we're doing here. It, I, my heart goes out to the family because after all, they lost a loved one and, and they just want justice. They wanna make sure that everything has been done to ensure that, that everything has been looked at. And that's what we're committing to do. Likewise, I met with the Daniels family about a week ago and I made the same commitment with them. When the case is filed with our office, uh, that case, like every other case, uh, is going to be presented to a grand jury and then they'll make the ultimate decision about whether or not there's sufficient evidence to to return an indictment. Uh, but I certainly, again, my uh, my heart goes out to them. I extended my condolences to them. Uh, I'm sure it was very frustrating that we couldn't uh, sit down and have this meeting until now. I know I don't want to get into the specifics of, of what was said by whom and, and all of that, but would term your meeting with the Marquise Jones family today. Well, at least from our side, uh, it was a positive meeting. It, it was opening the lines of communication. Uh, again, I explained to them that what we're doing is taking another look at it uh, and and seeing if if anything is different from the last time that, that I personally looked at it. 
uh, with this additional information. Uh, and that's what we're asking these other uh, individuals to do, these veteran prosecutors. And then, and then we'll see uh, where we go from there. I was very clear that I was not making any promises. Uh, and there were no guarantees made, and they understood that. I think they just appreciated hearing from them. And, and one of the things that they said is they felt like the system didn't respect them. They felt like they didn't get uh, uh, enough communication from the prior administrations. And again, I'm not here to cast aspersions. I'm not here to say anything other than this administration is, is here to communicate with the public and certainly with victims of crime and other individuals uh, that have been affected by what happens. And so that's that's what we talked about today. And I think they left uh, satisfied knowing that we're going to be transparent as possible. We're going to communicate uh, our findings to them. I want to ask you about another uh, officer involved episode that happened recently, and that is the case of um, Matthias Ometu. When this happened, Chief McManus said that he believed the officers acted appropriately in this case. Just based off of what you've seen with this video, do you agree with that? Well, it depends on what he's talking about when he says appropriately. Uh, I mean, I think uh, certainly things could have been handled better, but I think what he's talking about is at the, at the point where uh, they are detaining this individual and, and he uh, is resisting and causes uh, an injury uh, to the officers at that point the officers make a decision to file the uh, the assault against uh mr omitu uh the problem uh, i had was with the totality of the circumstances the problem i had with was their decision at some point they were going to transport him they were going to move him from point a to point b and the issue was whether or not they had enough to do that uh, but uh, so I was looking at it in terms of whether or not if a grand jury reviewed everything in a in a trial, would they come back with a with a uh, verdict of guilty? Um, and that's what we have to look at as mm -hmm. prosecutors. So I was already leaning toward uh, a, a potential dismissal. Uh, fortunately, the the officers, for a different reason, uh, were contemplating the same thing at some point. Uh, we communicated together uh, through Chief McManus. I think the officers were more concerned that that uh, Mr. Omitu not end up with uh, serious consequences for what occurred. Um, and so we, we arrived at the same place for different reasons. Ultimately, I dismissed those cases in the interest of justice with the consent and the approval of the, the, uh, the officers in this case, because I believe that was the right thing to do. And they also agreed that was the right mm -hmm. thing to do. I want to shift gears here a little bit and talk about the pandemic and and you know we've seen that judges talking about the backlog of cases that they've seen in their courts what does it mean for your office i mean what unique challenges are you guys facing because of your because of dealing with the COVID and just not having you know criminal cases that often well what the reality is although our office went to 75 percent working from home because all of our prosecutors have laptops. All of them have been able to work from home, but the uh, the process has to continue. Cases continue to be filed. We've had to push them through the system. So we know that we're going to, at some point, when we when we come back uh, uh, to where we have uh, courts uh, court dockets every day, we're going to have to deal with the backlog. So just if you look at a, a six block uh, time frame from from March to September. Uh, we started with about uh, 5,800 pending felony cases. Now we have 9,000 pending felony cases. Mm -hmm. So that's an increase of, of 3,200 uh, cases in six months. So we're talking about 540 cases per month in the last six months. So we're going to have to deal with those cases when we all come back to work full time. In addition to that, you know, one of my priorities is family violence. And we've been watching the family violence cases. And likewise, in that same block from, from for example, March of September of last year, we had 3,410 cases. This year in that same block from March to September, we now have 3,640 cases. So that's an increase of 230 cases. And those are just arrest, arrest cases. Those don't even take into account the cases that we know that are gonna be filed when the victims of domestic violence are sheltering in place with their abusers, once that's over with, they're going to seek 
uh, uh, the ability to file complaints against those abusers, and we're going to have to deal with those cases. So it's there's going to be plenty of us to for us to do when we come back full time. Indeed, there is. Thank you so much for your time, Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for staying up late with us. Not at, not at all. Have a good evening. You too. too. We'll be right back. New developments after the death of a man pinned to the ground by police in Rochester, New York. The police chief there stepping down and at least six top members of the force are now out of their roles as well. The changes come after days of protests over Daniel Prude's death. Here's ABC's Elwin Lopez. The entire Rochester, New York Police Command staff is out. Chief Laurent Singletary today announced his retirement along with Commando Morbido. Police Chief Laron Singletary stepping down at the end of the month. The move coming after a week of protests following Daniel Prude's death in March. Cries for justice filling the city streets after this body cam footage. Put your hands behind your back. Showing the 41 year old in what appears to be a mental health crisis. Police put a hood over his head pinned him to the ground after they say he became combative. Days later, he died at the hospital. Last week, the city's mayor said the police chief told her Prude died of an overdose and said the chief was not asked to resign. His career and his integrity and his, um, you know, has been challenged. He didn't in any way try to cover this up. Tuesday oh, evening, the chief released a statement saying in part, quote, the mischaracterization and the politicization of the actions that I took after being informed of Mr. Prude's death is not based on facts and is not what I stand for. What's next is still unclear, but the mayor says police reform is on the list. I can assure this community that I am committed to instituting the reforms necessary in our police department. Elwin Lopez, ABC News, Atlanta. Around America tonight, he was convicted in New York last year. Now the legal team for Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is appealing his conviction. They argue in part that having a fair trial was impossible. Guzman was held in solitary confinement in a Manhattan federal detention center for two and a half years before he was convicted. That was due in part to his history of prison breaks in Mexico. His attorneys allege the solitary confinement and a protective order, quote, constructively denied him counsel and a defense and made a fair trial impossible, end quote. The former cartel leader was sentenced to multiple life terms and ordered to forfeit nearly $13 billion. At least 76 wildfires burning around the country, fire and ice colliding in Colorado. Crews battling the Cameron Peak fire, which burned about 100,000 acres, got help overnight from Mother Nature. A cold front dumped rain and some snow on the Centennial State. In California, meanwhile, helicopter crews rescued at least 13 people trapped by the fast-moving Creek Fire. And in Washington, a fast-moving firestorm Monday night destroyed nearly 80% of homes and buildings in the town of Malden. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam. Oh, very nice 78 degrees. I know I got a little bit of rain at my house, which I was very excited about. I'm hoping it's the yes. first of many more showers to come. Yeah, well, we are expecting more to develop throughout the day tomorrow. It's not going to be an all day event, but there'll be hit or miss coming and going. And to put it in perspective earlier today, a solid half inch out of that downpour right along the 281 corridor from about downtown northward all the way into Bulverde. And that was just one quick splash and dash downpour that hit. We'll likely see more of those developing. So I could think of quick one to two inches is possible across parts of Bear County and some neighborhoods through the next couple of days. Let's take a look at the radar. Now you look west of town into the hill country and some nice showers developing there. Rock Springs just north of Lakey as well and clipping Bandera County moving into western Kerr County and the activity in Atascosa County starting to fizzle out in southern Atascosa County. But I do anticipate more development. We're seeing that development in the hill country. We'll continue to see some more showers few thunderstorms developing here and there. Nothing severe. It's all part of a bigger, very active weather pattern with the snow. Steve mentioned in that story about the wildfires. Yeah, the little snow, not even at the highest elevations. I mean, we're talking eastern Colorado here where down slopes into the plains. Snow being reported at this hour and measurable snow on the grassy surfaces. You could be talking half a foot in many locations. 
So the cold front draped across North Texas, that's going to continue to push our way. It's all part of this broad active weather pattern that's headed our way. And you can see the showers and storms activated along that cold front right now. Luckily, we're not expecting anything severe across the state, just some good soaking rain. First thing tomorrow morning, even before sunrise, most of the action probably closer to the Rio Grande, Valverde County and some locations west of town, but a few widely separated showers even near San Antonio. And then the second half of the day at, you know, after the noon hours when we're expecting better chances of more numerous showers and storms with the embedded heavy downpours because there's a lot of moisture in the air to be squeezed out. And those embedded downpours where they line up, I think a quick one to two inches is uh, quite possible in some neighborhoods. Of course, we all know how rainfall acts around here. It's streaky and it's going to be fairly streaky again as we get into tomorrow. Look at how's this for a map? 24 hour temperature change. Amarillo is 37 degrees cooler now than this time yesterday. Lubbock 30 degrees cooler It's because they're nearly 40 degrees there in the panhandle. Meanwhile, here we're in the 70s and 80s. Del Rio's 86 and 78 in San Antonio. That cold front is going to continue to push our way tomorrow. I think we'll be in the 80s. Our friends in West Texas and up in the panhandle will be 40s and 50s. But then by Thursday, this cold front drops in and somewhere in South Texas, it's going to stall and that's going to set up a big temperature spread. Some 80s closer to the coastline and even cooler in the northern hill country. But here in the middle, probably in the 70s by Thursday. So tomorrow, mid 80s, those increasing rain chances, fairly numerous showers and storms, still scattered in nature on Thursday with highs in the 70s. And then Friday into the weekend, we'll see another little bump in our rain chances by Sunday. From the bad cold, and then I started aching. Then I couldn't walk. The stillhead on the night beat. His family calls him the miracle man after his battle with COVID-19. Not only was he hospitalized, he was placed on a ventilator. Now he's back home. His story next. He's being called the miracle man after beating COVID-19 at 73 years old. Joshua James was hospitalized on a ventilator, faced several underlying conditions. My dad is diabetic. He is hypertensive. He does have high blood pressure. He does have an atrial fib. James says he helped at his church regularly with food giveaways, but one day started feeling a cold coming on, then complained about trouble walking. He was eventually diagnosed with COVID-19 and says he knew it was time to fight. His family offering prayers from around the country. He then remembers dreaming about his mother who died in 2014 and would pray for him every day. That's it, boy. I ain't going to pray for you no more. But I'm going to pray for you this time. I just knew everything was going to be all right now. James' daughter Jocelyn is a nurse and says while she stood firm in her face, she also credits her father's medical team. They use several treatments, including a plasma transfusion. All right, take a look at this. Bill Lambert is breaking a world scuba diving record at 100 years old. This is how he celebrated his birthday at Pearl Lake in South Beloit, Illinois. It's actually the third time he's beat a record since he started scuba diving. That feat even more impressive considering he didn't start diving until he was 98. Wow. His diving coach says scuba diving is a great exercise for seniors. Well, staying active in the midst of a pandemic has led more people outdoors. A brisk walk, jog, or run is great exercise for the whole family. But if you have a baby or a toddler, it helps to have the right equipment. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz looks at jo jogging strollers. Experienced racer Jackie Noblet is glad to be back at it, but now she has three little companions. I think we're getting to the point where I could schedule one loop with one kid and then do kind of a relay race where you take one out and then you put another one in. A good stroller that's built for jogging makes a big difference. The reason for using a jogging stroller in fixed wheel mode when you're jogging, you hit a bump or something like that, you want the wheel to be fixed in place so the stroller doesn't veer off or even tip over. The fixed wheel is great for running, but challenging for everyday use since the stroller is harder to maneuver, especially turning corners. 
A traditional stroller that can be used for jogging is more versatile. You can put the front wheel in the swivel position for everyday use or lock it straight for jogging. If you're going to buy a stroller and spend that sort of money, having multiple functionalities is kind of nice. For a traditional stroller that can be used for jogging, CR's top pick is the Kiko Active 3 Air for $300. Have two kids to push? CR recommends the Thule Urban Glide 2. It's more than $700. When buying a stroller for jogging, CR says look for a five-point harness. A handbrake offers better control as you jog. And consider the weight of the stroller, pushing it plus a child or three, maybe more of a workout than you bargained for. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, take a look at this. A massive one-eyed gator caught in Mississippi. By the way, one-eyed gator, a great band name. <laughs> the reptile is 477 wow. pounds, 12 feet long. John Ladner and his buddy were in a Mississippi marsh when they spotted what they thought was a log turned out to be this guy. Their John boat too small, so a friend came with a larger one. It took three hours to get the gator into the boat, and when they got it to shore, they had to use a tractor. Wow. To get it out of the boat. Look at that. I'm thing. just I'm in awe of the size of it. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Think of those guys in the History Channel. Yeah. Shoot them, shoot them. You know, with those uh, gator <laughs> hunters, right? Whatever that's called. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Good rain tomorrow and even into Thursday, and temperatures take a bit of a dive. Seven is Thursday. I think if I saw a gator as big as a log, I'm like, I'm gonna you're ride. good. I'm gonna you're ride. good. I'm yeah. going this way.